On the morning of August 28, 2014, this defendant, Adam Matos, threatened to kill the mother of his child, Megan Brown. And then later that day, he made good on his threat, came back and killed her, her parents, Greg and Margaret, and her new boyfriend, Nicholas Leonard. We are going to prove to you beyond a reasonable doubt that this defendant is guilty of murdering Megan Brown, Margaret Brown, Greg Brown, and Nicholas Leonard. Now, opening statement is my opportunity to give you sort of a table of contents of what we expect the evidence is going to show in this case. And if this case was a book, the title of the book would be, I almost got away with it. Margaret Brown and Greg Brown, you'll hear, they were both 52 years of age back in 2014 and were married. Megan Brown was their youngest child, their daughter. She was 27 years old. Now, Margaret and Greg, up until close before this happened, lived in Pennsylvania on a farm. Margaret bred horses, she raised dogs, and she worked at Wawa. Greg Brown, formerly an electrician, recently undergone back surgery and was recovering from that. They decided they were going to move down to Florida. Part of the reason being, Margaret Brown's father, Jim Thomas, resided in Florida. And Wawa was beginning to expand into Florida at that time, and Margaret Brown could transfer to a Wawa in Pasco County. They also knew someone who owned a house in the area that they were able to rent. And that house was at 7719 Hatteras Drive in Hudson. They came down and Megan Brown came with him. Megan Brown, at this time, had a son whose name was Ishmael Tristan Santistaban, but was referred to by everybody in the family as Tristan. Tristan's father is this defendant. And Megan, Tristan, and this defendant all came down to 7719 Hatteras Drive with Margaret and Greg. And they moved down right at the beginning of July, 2014. They moved down here, Margaret, was working at Wawa's. She's working at Wawa's down in 54. And Megan Brown gets a job, ultimately gets a job as a waitress at the Fisherman Shack, which is barely a mile from 7719 Hatteras Drive. Megan Brown, as a bartender there, meets Nicholas Leonard. Nicholas Leonard, a familiar face at the Fisherman's Shack, knows the people there, uh, and the two of them hit it off, and they get to know each other. Now, by August 27th, of 2014, Megan Brown's working, and one of her co-workers, Tanya Carlson, they're going to go out after work. They're going to have go, go to other places. Particularly, they're going to end up at the Anchorage Bar. Nicholas Leonard goes with him and a couple other people. Now, Megan Brown, when the family comes up to 7719 Hatteras Drive, Megan Brown has a Chevy Blazer that she drives around, a dark blue Chevy Blazer. Margaret and Greg have a, uh, a silver van, and they also have a large RV. Now, Megan Brown, even though the plates are expired on her Chevy Blazer, drives that short distance to the Fisherman Shack. But she doesn't drive it much beyond that. So she leaves her Chevy Blazer on August 27th in the, the early evening when she goes out with Tanya Carlson and Nicholas Leonard. And they go, they go out, and during the course of that evening while she's out, this defendant does not stop calling her. She ultimately returns home approximately 5, 5.30 in the morning, and at that time, this defendant attacks her with a knife. He attacks her with a knife, threatens to kill her in her son Tristan's room. Tristan wakes up, and the defendant flees. Law enforcement's called. Okay, tell me exactly what happened. Tell me exactly what happened, Megan. Okay, so he said, I just came home, and I was going to kill you, and then I put a knife to my throat, and I cut my hand in my place. Bro. 
Deputy Frederick Hydra can respond, and he responds approximately 6.20-ish in the early morning, early morning hours of August 28th. And he goes there, he sees the residents, he meets with Megan Brown. This defendant is gone. He's not there. Deputy Hydra can sees the injury. Megan got what she, to her thumb when she tried to keep the knife away from her throat. He takes photographs of what he sees at the residence at that time. Now later, by about 9 o'clock in the morning, Nicholas Leonard is heard of this incident. He is under the misimpression it is currently going on and calls 911 again, which results in Deputy Hydrican responding again. Once again, Deputy Hydrican gets there at this point, Megan Brown is there, and between the two visits, Deputy Hydrican has seen Megan Brown, Tristan, Margaret Brown, and Greg Brown, all at 7719 Hatteras Drive. But the defendant is gone. Over the course of the day, Nicholas Leonard makes his way over to 7719 Hatteras Drive based on that incident. And he brings with him his 380 Caltech firearm. Now the defendant continues to try and reach Megan Brown using his cell phone. And between the, the evening of the 27th and 3 o'clock in the afternoon on the 28th, more than 120 times this defendant tries to call Megan Brown. But after 3 o'clock in the afternoon on August 28th, this defendant never tries to contact Megan Brown again. Now about noon on the 28th, Greg Brown takes a silver van, goes to Napa, buys a spark plug gauge stop gapper. He also goes to Walgreens, makes a purchase in the silver van. And by 3 o'clock in the afternoon, Margaret Brown shift at Wawa is going to begin. And the 28th is kind of an unusual day for Margaret in that there's, the Wawas have a picnic that is going on. And so she's working at a different store. She's working at a store at Ridge Road in US 19, which actually is a little bit closer to her residence. Margaret Brown shift starts around three o'clock and she takes the silver van. While she's on her shift, she uses her credit card, credit card ending in 7785 to make a purchase of a soft drink and then at 11.10 p.m. after her shift is over, Margaret Brown leaves in her silver van from that Wawa. And that is the last point that Margaret Brown, Greg Brown, Megan Brown, or Nicholas Leonard are ever seen alive again. Now Margaret dies, she dies in her Wawa uniform, red shirt, black apron, Wawa logo. Blood shows that her blood is in the garage consistent with having parked her silver van and be entering the main residence from the garage and she was attacked. She's got multiple injuries to her head and ultimately her hands are zip tied together behind her back and two white plastic trash bags placed over her head and duct taped around her head and a significant circular injury to the left side of her head ultimately kills her. That circular injury 
you'll be able to see from the evidence and hear from the testimony, is consistent with a hammer. Nicholas Leonard dies up in Megan's bedroom. Now, 7719 Hatteras Drive is a two-story residence. It's a nice residence on a canal. The first floor, there's two different garages. They're connected together by a door. And there's a back room area. Now, the upstairs is really the living area, and the front door is actually on the second story. So there's a stairwell leading up to the front door. The house faces south, so the east side of the residence in the south is Megan's bedroom. There's a small hallway leading to Megan's bedroom and Tristan's bedroom with a bathroom separating them. On the west side of the residence is a master bedroom suite with a master bedroom, master bedroom closet, and a master bathroom. Nicholas Leonard, his head is bashed in. His forehead is caved in. Pieces of his skull are missing. There are tw at least 21 separate injuries all about his face and head and facial area, many of them of a circular nature. Again, as the testimony will show, consistent with a hammer. Now, Nicholas Leonard's blood all over Megan's bedroom. There's a large pool of blood on the floor. There's blood on various objects and areas of the room by the time law enforcement eventually gets there. And there's also a significant stain on a mattress pad. I'll talk about some later. Greg Brown dies in the master bedroom closet in the same white shirt and plaid shorts that he was seen wearing at Napa and at Walgreens. In Greg, Greg Brown's bedroom closet is indication that he kept his hunting gear because Greg Brown was an avid hunter. And Greg Brown is killed by two gunshot wounds, one to the back, passes through his body and severs a major artery there. I'll try and tell you what it is, but I'd get it wrong. I think it's the thoracic aorta. And then also a gunshot to the front. And there's a large stain of blood in the master bedroom closet. Megan Brown dies from a gunshot wound directly through her left eye, passes through her skull, and actually begins to exit when it's stopped by the, her scalp and lodges itself in the back of her head. Justin Okins and Christine Anderson live in the area that 7719 Hatteras Drive is in, and they're, late at night they're walking their dog, and it's in the area close up in the area of midnight, consistent with about the time that Margaret Brown would have been returning home from Wawa, or a little after. They're walking, and Justin Okins hears a small caliber firearm in the distance, in the general direction that could be 7719 Hatteras Drive, and he hears a bang! He says there's a pause, a couple minute pause, and then bang, bang, a little bit further apart than that, but then another minute pause or so, and then bang. At 12.31 in the morning, so just about a half an hour after midnight, Ryan McCann, who lives next door to 7719 Hatteras Drive, Ryan McCann is expecting his brother Alan McCann and his sister-in-law Lori McCann to drive, be driving in from Georgia. Is this is a Thursday, August 28th is a Thursday, and it's be starting to begin into the, the Labor Day weekend. Labor Day is uh, September 1st, the Monday of that year. Alan and Lori arrive at, ex at 12.31 in the morning, and they send a text to Ryan when they get there, hey, we're here. Ryan comes out, they're starting to get their things unpacked, and as, as Ryan comes out and as they're unloading the car, there's Adam Matos this defendant, coming from 7719 Hatteras Drive. And they see him and they, he's wet. Don't know if it's sweat, don't know if it's just had showered off, but he's all wet. And as they're taking their stuff in, this defendant kind of follows him in, talking to him. And he's with them for a little bit of time. Now, Nicholas Leonard had a, a blue pickup truck, dark blue, some parts light blue pickup truck that he would drive around and would have been at 7719 Hatteras Drive when Nicholas Leonard was present. Sometime between approximately 9.30 at night and about 5 o'clock the next morning, morning of the 29th, that blue pickup truck appears in Billy Earl's parking space. Billy Earl lives at, at a condominium complex less than a mile away from 7719 Hatteras Drive. And really, it's the, it's the first parking area once you enter the condominium area that, that you can come to. That truck stays there and is ultimately 
A few days later, towed away because it's assigned parking, the truck is not supposed to be there. On August 29th, during the daylight hours, this defendant begins to start selling the belongings of the Browns on Craigslist. He, start, he puts their TV up for sale on Craigslist. He puts Margaret Brown's dogs that she raises up for sale on Craigslist. And these are poodles and Yorkies and poodle Yorkie mixes, smaller dogs. But he's selling them for $50 a piece, which is a steal. People drive from Orlando to come purchase four of these dogs from this defendant. And in particular, uh, James Smith and Brandon Derry at about 2 o'clock on August 29th. They come and respond about the television. They come and knock on the door. This defendant answers the door. There's nobody else that they see there. And they say, hey, we're interested in this TV, you're, this large TV you're selling for $100. The defendant won't let them in. It says, oh, you, can, you can't see it from the door. Fine. It's a little odd. Like, well, you say there's spots on it. We want to see what the TV looks like before. We want to see how it works before we pay for it. He says, oh, I'll bring it out to you. I'll bring it out to you on the porch. And when he goes in to do that, they decide, this must be something wrong with this TV, we're leaving. And they take off. Patrick Duarte, who I refer to as having driven from Orlando, he comes to buy four dogs, deals with it, just this defendant. Paige Steele purchases a dog from this defendant, August 29th. This defendant orders pizza out pizza that's delivered to him on August 29th in the afternoon. No one else there but this defendant. And at 11... 30 going into midnight of August 29th, this defendant takes Margaret Brown's silver van and goes to Walmart, not too far from this area. He goes to Walmart in the middle of the night, he walks straight over to the garden section and gets a shovel. He takes a shovel, also picks out a PlayStation 4 and a game, and goes to buy these items with Margaret Brown's credit card. The same credit card she used the day before well, during her Wawa shift. Card is unable to purchase all these items, so he says, I'll leave the PlayStation 4 in the game. I just want the shovel. And he goes off with his shovel, loads it in the back of the silver van, and leaves. Now on August 30th, which now we're into Saturday, at the Fisherman's Shack, Megan's blazer, blue blazer is still there. Been left there, you recall, on the evening of the 27th. And the people of the Fisherman's Shack, having been aware of what had occurred the morning of August 28th, had been keeping an eye on it, kind of watching it, like, hey, what's the deal? And in particular, one of the regular patrons who was familiar with Megan, by the name of Kim Ward, she goes, she parks her car at the Fisherman Shack many mornings at about 8.30 and goes for a walk or a run in that area. And she leaves at 8.30 in the morning on the 30th, and the blue Chevy Blazer is still there. When she gets there at 9.30 in the morning, the blue Chevy Blazer is gone. During this period of time, the McCanns next door also continue to see the defendant in the area of 7719 Hatters Drive. Now, Sunday, August 31st, the defendant is still selling the dogs, still selling Margaret Brown's dogs. So people come to purchase a dog, they get the dog, the dog smells bad. And that night, which is Sunday night, which also happens to be the night before Alan and Lori McCann are going to drive back to Georgia, this defendant goes over while Ryan McCann, Al McCann, and Lori McCann are hanging out on their back dock area, because remember, these houses are on a canal. And they start to socialize, having a couple beers. And out of nowhere, this defendant asks Ryan McCann, hey, you have surveillance? And Ryan McCann, he'll tell you he's a boat captain, so he's gone for long periods of time, but he, he tells him, yeah, I got tons of surveillance. It wasn't actually the case. And by this time, Ryan McCann and Al McCann are noticing there is a terrible, awful smell in the area. And Alan McCann in particular, he's also a hunter, he's familiar with the smell, he says there's something dead. Now Ryan McCann, when they're socializing with this defendant, at one point looks over and says, oh, this smells dead around here, just looks at him. Ryan says, probably an arbitrary. And over the course of this, the interaction that Ryan McCann has been having with the defendant over between the 29th and about September 1st, he does ask him, he's like, hey, where's everybody else? The defendant tells him, oh, they went to West Virginia on vacation. And he says, well, they're still, the RV is still in the driveway. Oh, they took a taxi to the airport. By September 1st, the defendant now is coming over and asking Ryan McCann for a ride places. He's apparently not using the silver van anymore. But September 1st, he asks Ryan McCann, he wants to go cash a check, and Ryan McCann takes him to Winn-Dixie. 
And Dixie doesn't cash a check, but the defendant does make purchases there. And he's wearing, in particular, a camouflage Colonial Electric Tamp Pennsylvania t-shirt. September 1st, also, Papa John's delivers a pizza to somebody matching the defendant's description at 7719 Patters Drive. And at that point, Tristan is also seen, but nobody else. Well, September 2nd is a Tuesday, day after Labor Day. And it's also garbage day. And you'll hear that at 7719 Hatters Drive, there were many bags of garbage. Somewhere in the area of 10 bags of garbage, which was unusual for this residence. Possibly more. Garbage is collected and it's gone. Also on September 2nd, Jesse Fletcher, who was also a delivery person for uh, Papa John's, delivers a pizza there again. Which, by the way, was one of the pizzas was paid for with Margaret Brown's credit card. Jesse Fletcher noticed an awful smell as he's delivering the pizza and delivers the pizza to this defendant. September 3rd, Sharon Mann, who lives in the neighborhood, is walking her dog. She walks her dog by 7719 Hatteras Drive, which is actually on the corner of Old Dixie Highway and Hatteras Drive. And while she's walking in the morning hours, she notices a person matching the description of this defendant, which she can't see very well, with a hose spraying out of a door on the side of the residence that she she assumes is the garage door and sweeping out water. And when, as she comes by, the person shuts the door. Also on September 3rd, Ryan McCann keeps seeing this defendant. This defendant wants to go do something, he wants to go out. Ryan McCann ultimately goes out with him in the evening hours to Skinny's Bar. And they are there for about three hours. This defendant has a lot to drink. There's a rainstorm, so they end up there a little longer than they had expected. But afterwards, that night after 10.30, Ryan McCann brings this defendant back. Drops him off at 7719 Hatters Drive. September 4th, which is the fall, the Thursday after, August 28th, the day after, Ryan McCann drops his defendant off at 7719 Hatters Drive. September 4th, by now, family members are starting to be worried about Margaret and Greg and Megan. They haven't been able to reach him. Linda Thomas, in particular, who is Margaret's stepmother, calls in to the Pasco County Sheriff's Office, which is called a welfare check, which is, hey, can't reach my people. I should be able to reach my people. Somebody needs to go check on them. Deputy Silver responds, and when he gets there, he knows there's an awful smell. He knocks on the door. Nobody answers. He walks around the house. He can see there's a back room of sliding glass doors uh, at the rear of this residence. He sees a bunch of little dogs. He walks around. He's trying to figure out what's going on. Nobody's answering. No contact with anybody. Eventually, as things progress, he'll walk around again. When he walks around again, he notices the dogs, there's some dogs out now. As if someone opened the sliding glass door, some dogs got out, and nobody got them and put them back in. Deputy Silva, with Deputy Smith, continue to look around. They go through the residence. Hey, where are the people? Is there anybody in need of help? Anyone in distress? They go in. In the east garage, there is a silver van backed in, and there's a good amount of what appears to be blood. There's an awful, awful smell. There's maggots. They see a bullet on the driveway, a fired bullet on the driveway, and there's no people. There's a bunch of dogs in the back room with a lot of urine and feces, but no people. And they know there's a problem. So more law enforcement officers are contacted, investigations are started. And Sergeant Babcock, as this is going on, and they're beginning to learn the picture of what could have happened at 7719 Hatters Drive, Sergeant Babcock drives about three quarters of a mile north. Now, as I told you, this residence is on the corner of Hatters Drive and Old Dixie Highway. And at the time, not far north of this street, Old Dixie Highway becomes a dirt road where there's nothing but vegetation. And you follow that out and there was a berm across the road making it a dead end. Nobody out there. The only thing out there is an electrical substation that no, nobody works at. No people are there. Sergeant Babcock drives down this dirt road. He's got his window open and he gets to the end, the dead end where that berm is. And he smells an awful smell. They go just about 10, 15 feet off the roadway. You can't see it from the roadway because of some of the vegetation, but as soon as you get past that, there's a pile. Initially, you can't tell how many bodies are in this pile, but it is a pile of bodies. It ends up being a pile of four bodies. Megan Brown, Margaret Brown, laying side by side, head and feet going different ways. Greg Brown, right next to Margaret, and Nicholas Leonard's body, dumped on top. And they're in significant stages of decomposition. Law enforcement begins to search 7719 Havis Drive, trying to find out what has happened. 
and they find a lot of indications of what happened, but they also find evidence of substantial cleanup. Cleanup that would have taken hours. Told you about Megan's bedroom a little bit already. They go into Megan's bedroom, furniture kind of moved around, nothing really up against the wall, and there's no bed, no mattress. There is a mattress, however, found in the west garage behind a blue Chevy Blazer. That mattress has the pillow top cut off of it. There is a pillow top that was apparently cut off of a mattress found in a garbage bag next to the Chevy Blazer with a giant blood stain on it that matches Nicholas Leonard. There's a bullet hole in the wall of Megan's bedroom. You find the evidence of blood in Megan's bedroom, which ultimately is tested and matches Nicholas Leonard. In the living room, there's a TV, spot for a TV, but no TV. There's wires going to where the TV would be, but no TV. In the West Garage, I told you there's a Chevy Blazer. The Chevy Blazer has a flat tire, very flat tire. There's a mattress. There's a garbage bag with the pillow top in it, but there's a bunch of additional garbage bags piled around that. There's two garbage bags full of DVDs. One of the DVDs, later tested, and has some of Nicholas Leonard's blood on it. There's another garbage bag full of clothing items and a couple of other odd items, women's clothing items. There's also a sock, has Nicholas Leonard's blood on it. There's also a, a bullet. There's also a garbage bag with several items in it, some Papa John's boxes, some beer bottles, and a Colonial Electric t-shirt. Same Colonial Electric t-shirt that the defendant was wearing at Winn-Dixie. He was also seen wearing I may have forgotten to mention, on September 2nd, when he's seen going to Wells Fargo Bank with Ryan McCann. There's also Margaret Brown's two credit cards that had been used by this defendant to purchase items since August 28th. There's also a blanket with some of Nicholas Leonard's blood on it. Master bedroom, significantly clean, cleaned up. There's indications of cleaning, and there's some indications that there was blood in there, indications that there was a shooting in there. There's a couple of blood spots left that match Megan and are consistent with a shooting, but there's certainly not enough blood. There's also a, a bullet hole in a corner of a wall that is consistent with having come from the master bedroom closet and being shot back towards the master bedroom. Now in the east garage, there is that silver van I told you about. They open up the silver van and all the seats in the back are down. There's nothing in the back except for maggots, lots of maggots, and a shovel. A shovel appears to have some sort of dirt caked on it and the remnants of a sticker, like when you purchase a shovel that still has a sticker across it. There's a remnants of that. Well, law enforcement notices that on the east side of the house, there's an area of, of ground that appears to be have been freshly dug. So they dig in that. They can't dig down too deep because this area is lime rock. If you dig down too deep, you're going to hit lime rock and you're not going to be able to go any further. But what they do find in the hole is a sticker that matches the sticker on the shovel. And it's a shovel that is sold by Walmart. In East Garage, there's also bedding and carpeting with blood, a whole bunch of indications of things that have been moved there, or put there, with blood on them. Now, I told you that this... Uh, this residence is on a canal. Behind the residence, on the canal, there's really no other houses at this end of the canal, because this is the very end of the canal. 7719 is a corner lot. There's no house directly across from it. There's no houses beyond it. The canal ends. And then you would, if you kept going straight, you'd hit Old Dixie Highway going north. They go out to the back and they see on the dock here, there's a couple of bullets lying there, unfired bullets consistent with like rifles. So they get the dive team out and they go and they look in the canal. They look in the canal and they find multiple long rifles, about five long rifles and a shotgun in one area, a bunch of unspent ammunition consistent with those firearms, two crossbows, some crossbow accessories. They also find a cell phone further out. They find a 380 Caltech firearm and a magazine in a separate, slightly separate location. And they find a hammer. They take the bodies. I already told you, Margaret is found in her Wawa uniform. Greg is wearing what is left of a heavily stained white t-shirt, heavily stained plaid shirts. Because again, as I told you, the bodies are in a significant state of decomposition. Underneath Greg's body is found a bullet 
spent projectile. Testing reveals that that bullet, the bullet in Megan's head, the bullet out on the driveway, and the bullet found in the garbage bag in the West Garage, they were all fired from the same firearm. They are tested with the 380 Kel Tech firearm, which is Nicholas Leonard's, and it's inconclusive, but they could have been fired from that firearm. The fact that the Kel Tech came out of a canal does not assist in attempting to match up the bullet with a, that firearm. Now, while law enforcement is out there doing their investigation, particularly on September 4th, there is a heavy law enforcement presence. The road is shut down. People trying to get to or from their houses have to go through a checkpoint. Lights, sirens, news cameras. But while they're out there, see Hatter's Drive is a dead end and it's surrounded by a canal. At the dead end of that canal, there's a man who lives there, William Lusk, who has a canoe. And he keeps his canoe on his back dock. And between September 4th and September 5th, his canoe ends up across the canal at a, at a house where, the, where there's nobody there. Law enforcement, trying to locate the little boy, Tristan, what's happened to him, and Adam Matos on September 4th, they eventually find out that night that this defendant and Tristan take a taxi cab from deeper in the neighborhood, about approximately Yachtsman and Bertrand Drive, which is in walking distance from where the canoe is found across the bank. They take a taxi at about 10.30 at night, just past where the checkpoint is, where all the law enforcement officers and all the lights are going at 7719 Hatteras Drive. The taxi takes this defendant down to a bus station in Tampa. The defendant then goes to a hotel down there, Floridan Hotel. Can't stay at 7719 Hatteras Drive anymore. The law enforcement catches up with him at the Floridan Hotel and he's arrested. While there, they bring him to Tampa Police Department where Detective Kennedy and Detective Kugel, who are the, the leads on the case, they question him, start asking him. Really, they're, they're focusing on the morning incident of August 28, 2014, because that's what, that's what they arrested him for. And they know that this other investigation is going on, but it's still in its very early stages. None of the blood's been matched up yet. The bodies haven't been identified yet, although they have a, a good idea who they expect them to be now that they've located the defendant and Tristan. And they, they ask him about the morning incident. He says, oh, it's not what happened, but they, they asked me to leave. Would you ever go back to the house that Thursday? No, no, I never went back. I stayed with a, a friend in Newport Ritchie's house. What about the next day? What about Friday, the 29th? No, I didn't go back that day. I wasn't there. I stayed on the street. And the defendant subsequently agrees to do an interview with the Tampa Bay Times. And when he does that, Detective Kugel and Detective Kenny show up and listen in. And during that interview, he says, he didn't even know when he was talking to law enforcement, Detective Kugel and Detective Kenny, he didn't even know anyone was dead. He didn't go back to that house. Last time he spoke to Megan was the argument they had that morning. He doesn't remember what it was about, but it, was, it, wasn't, it, wasn't, any, it wasn't violent in any way. Never met Nicholas Leonard. They were just telling me that, you know, all this stuff happened and I didn't know what to think. I didn't know what to, how to react to this, you know. This is all new. When you were with your son and you were away from the mom, I mean, weren't you concerned about whether she was going to be concerned where he was? Or, I mean, how did that, how did that shake out? I don't know. Just can't remember. Do you remember the last time your son saw his mom? Uh, can't remember. Maybe, maybe August 28th. Have you or your girlfriend encountered anyone uh, that you might con consider the, to be a threat to your family out there? Um, there was a, a woman that kept calling and showing up around the house. Um, I don't know who, what her name is or who she is, but um, there, was, there was like threats being made from this lady and like letters 
being sent like back and forth. I guess she was she left letters or something like that at Megan's job. And I guess the lady called her job accusing her of, of different things like taking drugs and stuff like that. So I don't I don't know what, who this lady is or what her intentions are. But uh I know that she was she was uh she was pretty much stalking me. Do you consider yourself a violent guy? I mean, are you the type of person who can be capable of hurting someone like that? No. No. Well, I'm a nice guy. You know, anybody that, that knows me, I'm easy, easily to get along with. I don't start fights, you know. I'm pretty much, you know, a cool person to get along with. And everybody's looking at me like, you know, like I did it, you know. It's nothing I can say to change anybody's mind. You know, I can say I'm innocent, and you know, I can say I didn't do it. But, or, is anybody really gonna believe me? You know, all the fingers point to me, so. it's nothing I can really say or do to try to change anybody's beliefs. Now, ladies and gentlemen, the evidence will show that this defendant, after killing these four people, sold their stuff, engaged in substantial cleanup, ultimately disposed of their bodies on Old Dixie Highway. They tried to get away from the scene, distance himself from the scene, and obscure the scene to avoid detection. And the evidence that I've gone over with you now, it's not all of the evidence, it's a preview of the evidence. And after you hear from all the witnesses and see all the evidence in the form of pictures, videos, audios, we're going to ask you to find this defendant guilty of murder in the first degree. Guilty of murdering Margaret Brown. Guilty of murdering Nicholas Leonard. Guilty of murdering Gregory Brown. And guilty of murdering the mother of his four-year-old child, Megan Brown.